Thank you uh, very much for inviting me to this uh, nice uh, site and also the, the very important Kidney Week. It's a pleasure to be here. Maybe also to start with a question. So maybe you could raise your hands. Who of you asks for a genetic test each week? Two or three people. And who does that every month? Once a year? Ah. Thank you very much. So um, I think uh, there's a lot, a lot to do then, uh, because uh, I hope uh, in a year from now you will raise your hand that you do it every week, uh, because it, uh, as also shown by Andrew, it's becoming more and more important to do genetics tests early in the diagnosis of patients uh, with uh, kidney diseases. So just imagine that are you, if you're dealing with chronic kidney disease, more than 50% of children who progress to end-stage renal disease have a genetic disorder, and this is certainly also true for more than 10% of adults. By now, we know that mutations in more than 300 genes are associated with inherited kidney diseases. And luckily, we have now the ERCNET, which is a European uh, reference network for inherited kidney diseases, uh, and in that network, do try to sample all the patients through Europe with these diseases in order to give them better care in the end. So here you see a graph of the number of genes that have been identified through the years for monogenic renal disorders. And as you can see, especially after we um, got the new techniques of next generation sequencing, that was around 2009, the number of genes identified increased enormously, but what you also can see is that we found new roles for all genes. For instance, the well-known call for a 5 gene for Elport syndrome, identified already in the 1990s, was actually rediscovered as a gene also involved in focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So why is genetic testing so important? Well, first of all, we now know that it really ends a long diagnostic odyssey in many children and also now we know in adults. And that will then avoid further expensive and sometimes also fruitless testing. And the question now arises, do we still need renal biopsies in our patients? And I leave that to you to answer that question. It will also give you a clue to de de detection of potential extra renal features in patients, and I'm all gonna give you examples of all of this. It gives us clues now for management or early nephroprotection, and it can also give us decisions about whether or not transplantation is safe to do. Of course, very crucial for genetic counseling and reproductive options, and it also gives you answers to de determine whether related family members can actually be donors for uh, their affected family members. So genetic testing has been there for many decades, but it actually its significance had now increased with the use of next generation sequencing techniques. So these techniques actually came to us um, from 10, 2010, and if you look back in the time when I was doing my PhD around 1990, you could just imagine that we could do 3,000, sequence 3,000 base pairs per day, meaning that finding a gene could take you sometimes years and years. By the time that the human genome uh, sequence was um, uh, uh, actually uh, completely discovered around 2000, we could do about 500,000 base pairs per day, and nowadays we can do 100 million base pairs per day, meaning that your full genome can now be sequenced within one day. So an enormous, enormous advantage, advantages. However, sequencing your full genome is not so difficult, but of course, to understand the meaning of that genome, so to really find the significance is much more difficult. And that's why people have thought of reducing this genomic complexity towards something that we can better understand. And this, these are targeted next generation sequencing approaches. So what we can do is take out part of the genome, which is called the exome, and this is actually your coding sequence. It's about 1% of the full genome. So whole exome sequencing just looks at all this, the coding variants in your genome. 
but you can even do it more, uh, uh, more sophisticated towards a certain disease phenotype, and that means that you only actually sequence gene panels within that genome, a set of gene in the context of a patient's phenotype. So also in diagnostics, we have three options now. We can have the disease-specific multi-gene panels we are using. We can use whole exome sequencing, man all the genes, all the coding variants, or we can do the complete genome, whole genome sequencing. And the latter is already being done uh, in diagnostics nowadays too. So just to give you a, a very short comparison of these techniques, Actually, uh, as I said, the targets, of, of, of course, are different, and also the costs, so gene panels, are far more cheaper than, of course, the whole genome. The data, the detected variants, of course, are much lower in a gene panel and are very, very high in whole genome. And what's very important for you as nephrologists to know is that with these def different techniques, you cannot always detect the so-called copy number variations in your genome. These are deletions or duplications in your genome that have been shown to be important also in the context of disease. For instance, in CACUT, the congenital abnormalities of the kidney and urinary tract, copy number variations have been shown to be the cause of these malformations in 10 to 20 percent of cases. So it's important that you know that with gene panels and with exome sequencing, finding these CNVs is much more difficult than in whole genome sequencing. So this is just an example of a panel we use in a patient with proteinuria and microscopic hematuria and hypertension and a slightly decreased renal function. And he had some uh, family members also with proteinuria and um, a renal biopsy showed FSGS. There was no deafness in the family. And in this panel, it's, an, it's a nephrotic syndrome, FSGS panel of 74 genes, we identified a mutation in the cold 4 a 5 gene known to be associated with Alport syndrome. So this is actually a patient that has Alport syndrome. And of course, this has implications for his treatment too. So these multi-gene panels are now available in many uh, genetic diagnostic labs, and this is just a summary of what we did in a large European consortium, Euronomics, on genetic renal disorders. And you can see there are panels for steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, tubulopathies, complement disorders like atypical HUS that you saw in the film, and also the congenital abnormalities of the kidney and urinary tract. And as you see, the diagnostic yields, so finally, in how many patients can you find a diagnosis using these panels, it is different for different panels. The highest for the tubulopathies, the lowest for the congenital abnormalities. And it is important to know that these multi-gene panels are nowadays exome-based. So actually, you sequence the full exome and then you filter for the genes relevant for the disease you are interested in. And this is a nice way because if new genes for this same disease are being identified through research, then you can easily add these genes to your panel and filter also for these genes. As I already showed you, um, there is, by doing more and more of these uh, panels in different patients, we get a sort of broadening of phenotypic spectrum of diseases both across and within kidney, uh, current kidney disease categories. For instance, mutations in LMX1B were known to cause nil patella syndrome, which is a combination of nil and patella abnormalities and kidney disease. But by sequencing more patients, we now know that also patients with just a renal phenotype can have mutations in LMX1B. I already mentioned the call for a 5 genes in Elport syndrome that are now found in patients presenting with focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. And the same is true for PAX2 mutations that were known to give the renal coloboma syndrome and now also found in patients presenting with adult onset FSGS. And this is, of course, important because patients with call for a 5 and PAX2 mutations will not benefit from immunosuppressive treatment. 
as is usually um, uh, tried in patients with FSGS. So the diagnosis, the genetic diagnosis, certainly has great implications for the management of these disease of these patients. This is a, an example of a, a panel, a large panel of more almost 400 genes for renal disorders that we uh, supplied to patients uh, under the age of 30 years with severe chronic kidney disease. And as you can see in this panel, we found a mutation in 15% of these, these uh, cases, so uh, important. But what's even more important, that in addition to confirming the clinical diagnosis of some of these patients, we actually revised the clinical diagnosis in half of them, in 7%. So that this is really important to show you. And Albertine van Eerden, one of uh, my team, a, a, PA, a PhD of my team, received actually the Young Investigator Award from the ERA EDTA for this work. And just to show you an important example, two of those revised diagnoses were actually tubular interstitial nephritis, histologically proven, and a patient with chronic renal failure due to systemic infection. In these patients, both these patients, we found pathogenic mutations in the NPHP1 gene, which is one of the important genes known to cause the so-called autosomal recessive nephronophthesis. And nephronophthesis is actually a rather frequent disease we know by now in one in 50,000 patients. And actually it was known to be a pediatric disorder mainly in children um, uh, seen. Very nonspecific presenting symptoms, often diagnosed when there was also already advanced CKD, and typically these patients go to end-stage renal disease in their early teenage years. But now we see this in patients with, la, la, with la, much older uh, CKD, as I showed you. So we wondered actually, um, could more patients with adult CKD have nephronophthesis? And here you see a, a graph of all of the different uh, genes that have been involved in nephronophthesis, the most important again being nephronophthesis type 1, NPHP1. And what's also interesting is that if you look within the NPHP1 mutation spectrum, then most mutations, 80%, have a full deletion homozygously, so on both alleles um, of this gene. So it's completely knocked out, you could say. And we wondered whether this homo homozygous full gene deletion was present in more patients with adult uh, onset chronic kidney disease. So what we did is we SNP genotyped more than 5,000 uh, renal transplant recipients that had their first renal replacement at adult age and compared that to donor controls. And to our surprise, we found this homozygous MPHP1 deletion in one of 100 of these patients, so in about 1%, especially in the ages between 18 and 15 years, and that was absent in controls. And um, this was very surprising to us. So that means that one in 100 of your patients have actually this uh, deletion homozygously. And that probably means that nephronophthesis is far more frequent in your patients with adult CKD than you now can think of. If you look to the clinical diagnosis in these patients, then you see that only 3% had a correct clinical diagnosis. The rest had diagnoses like uh, unknown etiology, hypertensive nephrosclerosis, glomerular disease, et cetera, et cetera. So again, indicated how difficult this diagnosis is made from a clinical point of view. And just because we only looked at this specific deletion only, and that we know that there are many more nephronophthesis gene, it's probably likely that nephronophthesis, as I said, is far more frequent in your patients with adult onset CKD. So it underscores also the importance of genetic testing in adults. And this was very recently in the New England Journal of Medicine by the group of Al-Gharafi, very nicely actually confirmed. 
So he, in more than 3,000 adult CKD patients with onset above 20 years of age, did a large gene panel of more than 600 nephropathy-associated genes and found mutations in these genes in about 10% of cases. And you can see here, most of the diagnostic yield was found in the congenital renal diseases or cystic renal diseases, but also in nephropathy of unknown origin. And if you look to the genes that were actually identified diagnostically, you can see that most of them were the PKD1 and 2 genes, which of course is understandable, but also again these COL4A5 and COL4A4 and 4A3 genes, previously known to be involved in Alport syndrome. UMOT was one other, and then there were 60 other genes that actually each of them were was found less frequently. So if you would look at clinical predictors of your diagnostic yields, then patients, of course, with a family history, you should do diagnostic testing. When there is congenital disease or cystic disease, or whether you have no clue at all, so there's unknown origin of your, of your um, CKD. So for diagnosis, I think I've shown you how important genetic testing is, but it also has implications for management. First of all, to, do, um, ex to find extra renal, potential extra renal features. And this is what we call reverse phenotyping. So based on the genetic diagnosis you find, you can think of other features that might be uh, present in, uh, in patients with that disorder, but are maybe very subclinical or very subtle. This is an example of um, a, one of those cases, and uh, we're dealing here with uh, CACUT, so the congenital abnormalities, and in CACUT you find mutations, or again, copy number variations, up to 20% of your cases. And the most common genes involved are HNF1 beta and PAX2, and both are known to be involved both in isolated cases of CACUT, but also in syndromal. And for instance, here we had a family where we had CACUT, as you can see, in many family members, and there was no known eye disease in this family. We found a PAX2 mutation, and then sent all of them to the ophthalmologist. And indeed, we found optic renal, optic nerve colobomas in these mutation carriers. So they didn't have isolated CACUT, but they had renal coloboma syndrome. Another example is these two uh, brother and sister I saw in my clinic that had intellectual disability and obesity, and they both had a large head. We didn't know what they, ha what they had, and we did whole exome sequencing, so sequencing all genes, all coding variants, and we found mutations homozygously in the so-called BBS1 gene, which is a gene for barded beetle syndrome. So we wondered, do these kids have barded beetle syndrome, and if so, they might have some kidney problems and eye problems. So we did an ultrasound, and indeed, the boy had renal cysts, and he also had retinal abnormalities. And the girl didn't have any renal abnormalities yet, but might develop them still, and had retinal abnormalities. Again, showing you example, going from a genetic diagnosis, actually, to clinical phenotyping. Clues for management, yes, there are a lot, and this is an example of a, a story some years ago um, where it was shown um, that in uh, children with very um, uh, severely ill children in a neonatal intensive care unit where they did whole genome sequencing within two days, and they found almost a 60% of diagnosis of immediate clinical usefulness in 65% of them, and in about 20% it was having a fav favorable effect on management, for instance because it was a metabolic disorder, and it also instituted palliative care in 30% of them. We had a very recent case, uh, again, a severe neonate, ill neonate with congenital nephrotic syndrome, very severe brain abnormalities, hypothyroidism and facial dysmorphism, and had this girl had a brother that died actually a few years 
weeks after birth with exactly the same picture and there was no diagnosis. We didn't have a clue what this child had, so again, we did rapid whole exome sequencing and we found a mutation in the so-called uh, Cheops complex, a gene uh, belonging to the Cheops complex, and these genes are known to give the galloway mowat syndrome, which is a combination of rephrotic syndrome and microcephaly. And this is a very severe syndrome, and you know that most of the children will die very soon. So we introduced palliative care, the child could die at home, and of course for the next pre pregnancy we have possibilities for prenatal diagnosis. For nephrotic syndrome, it's also important to know what mutations are actually present. As you might know, most of these involve genes that are uh, involved in the function of the slit diaphragm of GBM. And as you can see, many, many genes have been identified for nephrotic syndrome during the years, most of them, again, after we had availability of the next generation, uh, uh, next generation sequencing techniques. We now know that the patients with the recessive disease-causing mutations do not respond to steroids or other immunosuppressive agents, so it has no use to try them. So it early diagnosis really have imp as implications for treatment here. We also know that as there are, if patients have mutations in genes that belong to the coenzyme Q10 biosynthesis pathway, and there are several of those, they, those patients have been shown to benefit from coenzyme Q10 supplementation. They really uh, have benefits from that. And we also know that after transplantation, in patients with disease-causing mutations, the recurrence is very low, with the exception of one that I will show you later. How about the eligibility of living-related donors? So this is an example of a family I saw, and there were two kids with Alport syndrome, and both parents, of course, wanted to donate a kidney to one of their sons. We found a, a hemizygous pathogenic call for a five mutations in both sons, and unfortunately, or maybe also a little bit expectedly, mother was a heterozygous carrier, and of course could not be a donor for their sons. And then, of course, you are forced with a situation to, what, to whom of the sons is the father giving his kidney and what, would do, what to do with the other child. So this is just to mention you a very nice summary in Nature Review Nephrology, again from the uh, Algarabi group, that very nicely shows you clinical utility of genetic diagnosis, clues for prediction and management, and also, again, reversed phenotyping with very nice examples, some of which I showed you before. So this is all very, very nice, but are there then no, no problems at all? Of course, there are still a lot of challenges. First of all, what is the best diagnostic test to use in your patients? And of course, there are many things you have to think of. First of all, costs. It's also not uh, that in every country um, this is covered by health insurance. Do you have a clearly defined phenotype that you can use a multi-gene panel? And of course, it's also important to know the number of genes involved. So if you have a lot of genes involved, then of course you use a panel and not go gene by gene by gene. And there are other difficulties. First of all, in the interpretation of the identified variants. First of all, it's not a black box, so we put in DNA and the answer comes out. There's a lot of things to do. You have to do a lot of bio bioinformatics, sometimes you need animal models to really prove that the variant you find is pathogenic, and you have to compare your data to a lot of databases where healthy persons are available. And one of the most different, difficult things we are faced with today are the so-called variants of unknown significance. So if you want to understand whether a mutation you identified is pathogenic, you have some in silico cool, uh, tools, but they are not really very helpful. And we have classified the variants we find in those that are clearly not pathogenic or that are clearly pathogenic. But in between is the number three, the variant of unknown significance.
and we don't actually know how to deal with this in clinic. And so the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics said you should never use variants of unknown significance in clinical decision making, but you should do everything to try to find out whether your mutation is pathogenic or not. So you can do family analysis, you can do functional studies, you can share your data around the world, but of course in a clinical setting, this is very difficult. And they also say, well, if you think of a disorder based, based on such a variant of unknown significance, you could try to do some monitoring for the disorder in question. Another difficulty, and it's really important, is that you should understand that the mutations in databases and literature are actually, some of them, are now proven to, not, to be not real mutations. They are called into question as being a mutation because we have sequenced so many more healthy persons that now appear to have the same mutations. And in a very uh, preliminary study, um, we have shown that about 5% of all the gene variants that are in the human genome mutation database actually have a far too high prevalence to match with the disease prevalence and they are likely to be false positives. So always be very careful when going into all the literature and in databases and reassure yourself that the variants are indeed pathogenic. Finally, there are ethical and social issues, and the most important of them is actually the, uh, are the so-called incidental findings. Incidental findings are findings that have nothing to do with the original meaning or reason of your analysis, and they are, found, are found in about 1 to 8 percent in the literature. And it's very difficult to deal with these. Do you give them back to the patient or not? And actually, there is now increasing consensus that if you have life-saving data or data that have immediate clinical utility, you should give this back to your patients. So, to summarize, I think um, both Andrew and I have shown that next-generation sequencing techniques are increasingly found their way in routine clinical diagnosis of rare renal disorders, but also in uh, CKD. It's important to test your patients early in the diagnostic process because it can have not it only have implications for the diagnostic odyssey to sort of end that, but it can also have a meaning, of course, for uh, extra renal problems, for uh, decisions about transplantation, to, to decide about whether family members are really uh, eligible for giving their donors and for genetic counseling and reproduction. In adults with CKD, genetic testing is especially recommended when there is an unknown origin in congenital or cystic disease and of course in the case of a positive family member, positive family history. Remember that nephronophthesis is a, result, is a disorder that you should certainly consider in unexplained renal failure in adults. I've shown you that there are a lot of challenges still, uh, especially uh, in the analysis of the data that come out of next generation sequencing, and especially the variants of unknown significance are giving us many problems. Incidental findings that reveal conditions that are actionable should be returned to your patients, and be very careful when using all the literature describing pathogenic variants. Ask yourself, what is the strength of the supporting variants? And with that, I want to thank you for your attention.